sorry, I'm trying to figure out how I can talk without this echo. Hello. Hi, Felice. Hi. I want to be honest with you. That last class um, was over my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My head. I, uh, you know, I'm wondering about that one. That was. Uh... It was ooh, intense. It was very intense. Very knowledgeable, intense, but I knew nothing about Photoshop. And I still don't know yeah, yeah. It, it's, it may be a. Uh, Maybe a software that's just not doable in terms of teaching it in an hour. <laughs> oh, you're good, but I think you have to be at um intermediate level, not a beginner, yeah. like more novice to the point where you don't you just heard the word Photoshop and that's it. You don't know what it is or what it means. Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, oh my gosh, because <laughs> everyone else in there knew what they were talking about. I'm looking at what is this thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry, I know that one was tough. So. Yeah. Help. I mean, once I maybe learn it, it might help. In the beginning, it's like, Woo. yeah, yeah. Hey, David. Hello. How are you? Fine. How are you, Scott? Good. 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 We have quite a few people signed up today, so I'm going to give it a couple of minutes for everybody to get in. Okay. I really appreciate everybody being here today. This is a brand new class. I didn't know uh, how much appeal it would have. Oh, well, you have a good turnout. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and get us started. There may be a couple of other people. Well, there are a lot of people still streaming in. Maybe one more minute. Hello, everybody. Uh, while people are popping in, is there anybody brand new to get set up? Anybody who's taking a class with us for the first time? We're all veterans. Oh, shoot. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think I've taken 75 classes. Wow. Wow. That is impressive. I've taken a lot of classes. Okay. I see Priscilla, I think, raised her hand, and I saw another one, but I missed it already. So, so. and I also teach a writing class once a week. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. I've taken Carolyn's creative writing class too. That's not too bad. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and get us started. And hopefully there won't be too many people uh, get the stream in here. Uh, my name's Scott. For those of you I haven't met before, happy to have you here for this world premiere of Tips on Better Writing. And uh, this class is designed really to apply to, it's really sort of a uh, macro look at just constructing sentences and paragraphs 
in an effective way, no matter what kind of writing you're doing. So if it's writing an email to somebody, writing an essay, writing an, a letter to the editor, anything like that, these are just a uh, few things to keep in mind as you're doing that to make your communication uh, a little more effective. Okay, so let me get started here. All right. Just want to make sure too, is everybody hearing me okay and seeing my screen? Perfect. Okay, terrific. Okay. All right. So just a little about me. I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside of Washington, DC. And I have a degree in journalism. I've been a writer throughout my professional career. And I've worked as a reporter and a news director and an editor, uh, created some blogs, still do a little bit of blogging. So writing has kind of been in my blood. Uh, I really enjoy the interactive learning here on Get Set Up. So that's why I'm here. I love the community building mission. I love seeing familiar faces and I really enjoy meeting new people in each class too. And I usually learn something in each class. Somebody always has a great observation or fact to contribute. So that is really terrific. <clears throat> And just a little bit more about Get Set Up. We're here to help you learn useful skills from your peers. And we learn from each other. Ideally, we can see everybody on camera if you're not too shy. Uh, and we are recording the session. So if you, and I wanna make sure I do have it on record. Yes, okay. So if you would like, a copy of the recording you can email us at help at getsetup.io and we'll be happy to send that to you and get up set up is not paid to promote any specific products i don't think i'm mentioning any products today maybe one but uh but still good for you to know if you're joining us by live stream today welcome glad you're watching the best way to participate though is to uh, register for a class and join us so hope you can do that in the future. So what we'll talk about today are just some simple ways to structure sentences and paragraphs effectively, uh, creating so using some strong verbs and metaphors to really get your points across and edit editing yourself effectively. And if there is anything else that anybody is really interested in learning today, uh, my colleague Lester is here and he will be able to, in fact, I need to do one little thing for Lester here, and he'll be able to keep me up to date on any questions that come in the chat. I'll stop. Uh, here and there during the course of the hour to uh, take any questions or comments, anything like that. So, okay. All right. So uh, I was, because we have so many people, I'm probably not going to have time to do a lot of dialogue here about what kind of writing experience you've had. Looks like some people have quite a bit. Um, but one of the first tips I would say for uh, writing better is to read, 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 and really to think about what you read or what you don't mind reading every day and stop and think specifically uh, what you notice about that writing, what, what makes it enjoyable to read, what might you not like about it, and what is it that you hate reading, um, anything that that uh, you have to read for whatever reason, and it's just a chore. And think about why it's a chore. And so for, for uh, the actual crafting of a sentence, uh, let's get into word usage. I like to drop certain adverbs. I think some of them are just really needless and are substitutes for just a very strong adjective. 
when you drop when you use adverbs like very highly quite extremely simply basically essentially it just doesn't need to be there there's a better way to say it so take a sentence like this you write to somebody and you say i'm quite pleased with the very fine work you've done well there's a better way to say that it's much shorter and it has a little more impact i'm delighted with your work or i love your work either way you're getting that message across without the and it's a little more emphatic than just saying i'm quite pleased and then there are these qualifiers and colloquialisms that uh, are really unnecessary and sometimes at least for me kind of aggravating uh being that in my humble opinion needless to say for what it's worth at this point in time as a matter of fact in fact ones that really get me in writing are the thing is or what happened was that you know we can use these in conversation and they're fine but when it comes down to writing really clearly and uh concisely they just don't work they really bog down your text and so here are some other examples it goes without saying then why say it not to mention then why mention it obviously or of course if it's that obvious why say it so just maybe keep that in mind when you're starting to write uh, phrases like that here's another one as far as i'm concerned that's a big one that we use a lot of times we can wait until next year to sell the store just an example of a sentence you can shorten that to we can sell the store next year The thing about smartphones is you usually need to upgrade every couple of years or so. Why not just say smartphone users usually upgrade every two years? And then there are these cliches that you see all the time and I like to avoid them as much as I can. And you also run into cases where as common as a cliche may be to you some people may have no idea what it means and uh yeah i remember the first time i heard somebody use the term throw the baby out with the bath water i had no idea what that meant and there are some others here some people may have no idea what you mean when you say i don't have the bandwidth uh, that's a newer term kind of emerged in the digital age when we're now pretty aware of what kind of uh, uh, up, downstream and upstream internet service we're getting, things like that. But uh, some people may not know what that is. And then you've got things like at the end of the day, I have heard that one ad nauseum, fit the bill, rock the boat, dime a dozen. Yeah, movers and shakers is a really tried and uh, or really uh, overused one, I guess I should say. And also think about using concise words because they are uh, shorter, number one, and brevity. I'm a big believer in brevity in terms of sentence structure and word choice so instead of a word like utilize these eyes words are the ones that uh, i think are unnecessary try just saying use or in close proximity just say near facilitate why not just say help and finalize why don't you just say finish or complete and then 
another thing to be aware of is redundancy. And these are terms that we use a lot and probably use incorrectly. And I'm guilty of this. Uh, things like circle around. Well, you can just say circle. If you're circling around something, you're circling it. Added bonus, a bonus is additive. So you don't need to call it an added bonus. That's what it is. Write down, you can just say right during the course of, just say during. And this last one, global pandemic. I've heard that, we've heard that a lot over the last year. Well, a pandemic is inherently global. So we don't need to call it a global pandemic because it is global naturally. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. And another thing to keep in mind is using active voice. Uh, and you've probably heard this before, but it is really easy to get away from that. And sometimes when we speak, we don't use it, but here, is a case where you might write something down and you'll say this chair was given to me by my favorite aunt just say my favorite aunt gave me this chair keeping the doors locked at night is something my wife and i always make sure to do before we before going to bed much simpler to say my wife and i lock the doors before going to bed much easier sentence to read flows better and this one i love and you'll see this a lot sometimes politicians will use this when there's a scandal brewing or something like that and they have to have a press conference or something or make a statement write a written statement mistakes were made so somebody's got to take responsibility here and when you say mistakes were made that is like one of the most evasive things you can say in my mind so you know i think you need to own up and say we made mistakes or even tighten it up more and say we aired okay so i'm going to stop there for a moment and see if anybody has any reaction to any of that any thoughts anything you disagree with uh, feel free to mute yourself for a second and anything. Uh, uh, I personally find it fascinating. It is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And not, not, somebody said not basically, uh, yeah. <laughs> Judge Judy. Yeah. Well, you don't realize that you're doing it until you, until you just pointed it out there. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. oh, how many times do I say that? You know, sometimes some of them things I'm like, okay, guilty. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's one thing to do it in conversation, right? I mean, we all do that. And I've used some of those cliches in conversation. Uh, it's when you're writing it and you're really trying to communicate through the written word that you want to think about uh, engaging people with something that's not going to bore them. <laughs> um, you know, Scott, on the computer, sometimes when you put in these qualifiers, if you notice there's a correction on, on the, uh, like in Word, mm -hmm. and, and they'll correct it to a simpler way of saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I'm going to point out something too called Grammarly in a few minutes uh, is something that does. It's like uh, the uh, spell check and grammar on Word, only on steroids. It's much better. So see a couple of other hands up. Uh, Priscilla, yes. Uh, yes, I have to be very careful in using cliches because I tutor English is a foreign language, as a second language, other language students. And I recall saying something like, run for your money. You give me a run for your money and everybody's looking around for the money. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have yeah. to be really, really careful because most of our tutoring is conversation. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, and these are people from all different countries. And it's like, what is she talking about? Right. You know, my wife speaks English as a second language, and I so sometimes have to watch that around her. And she speaks English fluently, but there are some terms that sometimes I hit her with that she has no idea what I'm talking yes, about. And, so. and, and I, 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 my ex-husband is from West Africa, and when he first came to the country to go to college, he was calling an eraser a rubber. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've... And you know, things like too. that. So you really do have to be careful with the cliches. Yeah. Yeah. But I find this, uh, as Miss Swat said, I find this very interesting. Oh, well, very good. Interesting. Good. Glad to hear. Uh, Lily, I see you have a hand up too. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. This is very interesting. Is there, have there been any studies or is there any empirical way to evaluate what um, all the things that you've said? I mean, in terms, I mean, I, um not that i know of off the top of my head there probably have been some studies about uh how people respond to certain writing styles and things like that a lot of a lot of what i'm pointing out here i learned in journalism school and they've been sort of uh the the rules of the road in uh in writing for quite a long time some of it you find in uh well what is it uh the famous book the uh, on writing by shrunken white or shrunken right somebody who has done a lot of work in this area is steven pinker who is a harvard professor and he's done a lot he some of it i think he's just op opining but um he has done a lot of writing about writing <laughs> And uh, hmm. make some interesting observations about uh, about the way, especially, and I'll get into this in a little more detail later, the way uh, we write when we're writing about something we're very versed on. Um, Scott, could you just spell how Steven Pinker goes so I can look that book up? Sure. Um, uh, I think it's, I think I have this right. Steven Pinker, he's at Harvard. And I can't remember the actual style or actual title of the book, but I can include that in the notes that I sent okay. out afterward. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott? Yes. This is Mary Virginia. Um, one of the things that I was curious about as you were speaking is that all of the genres have such different styles. So the way you would write poetry is going to be radically different than the way you write an editorial or an op-ed right. or something like that. Right. Is there any um, folks that you know who um, talk about language for some of those genre styles? Because I would think that sometimes while we want to avoid the tr the trite and the cliche, we also want to make sure that if we're writing that in a way that requires more cadence, it won't have necessarily the same sort of rhythm and brevity that it would have if we're trying to write shorter sentences, right. shorter yeah. words and images. So Yeah, and that's a really good point. And I think if you're, say, like writing fiction or writing uh you know even some creative nonfiction or something like that you want to you want to elaborate a little bit and and you don't want to get so concise that it's boring and uh just sort of subject predicate and that's it there's still some of these approaches though are still not bad to use even when you're writing some of that creative uh, stuff. One person that I got really tired of reading um, is, uh, as much as I liked his storytelling, was um, uh, John Updike. And sometimes I thought his sentences and paragraphs were a little God. long. Oh, oh, the enemy can't have them today, God. We say no, Lord. We say, God, 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 you are a God of God. You are almighty, the often old neighbor. You got all okay. Power. I will mute that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is, but okay. Uh all right. Yeah. So and 
I thought I saw one other hand up. Did I miss that? No. Okay. Scott, this is Dave from Maryland. Yeah. Hey, David. Uh, real quick, uh, uh, pointing out these examples is very helpful because I, I've been trying to write a blog, so this really drives home the point. Seeing it with the way you you put it on the on the slides, and then I had a question. I have a uh, a blog that I follow and a podcast, and he he I've talked to him about how he writes, and he says I try to write how I talk. Yeah. So I'm curious what your observation of that is. Um, that is, a, that, that's really interesting. I've heard a lot of bloggers say that, that you want to communicate like you talk. And I, I follow that to some extent too. But um, I also try to keep my sentences um, fairly tight. And when I say tight, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be really short, but just, I try to keep them from getting bogged down with a lot of words that I don't need. And I'm going to get into this a little more. Some of it is your your word choice, your choice of verbs and uh, how they can really enliven your language and, and your prose when you stop and think about what you're trying to say. Do, do so. you do you use a technique or know other people who would who would dictate it and then go back and then you know it, it'll it'll take your voice and put it on, on a word document and then you go back and edit it that have you ever tried that or you know somebody who tries a, that technique i haven't tried that i have heard people uh read out or i have done this read my uh writing out loud to myself okay. and that helps me think about it in a different way i've also had other people read it uh yeah okay. so there are, and i'm gonna david i'm gonna talk a little okay. bit about editing yourself so I'll, I'll have some pointers there on that count scott i just want to also quickly say that just uh by virtue of writing my writing gets tighter and tighter mm -hmm. like especially being in this uh writing club for like a year yeah every, every week writing writing and um it's 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 tightened up a, a lot yeah yeah and you know there is really something to be said for just writing as much as you can if you really want to be uh really want to pursue writing as a serious pastime or even a vocation so jumping off of what david was bringing up uh something that i like to think about for myself when I'm writing is jacking up my verbs. And when I say that, I mean, just looking at what I've written and see if I can almost dramatize it a little bit or just find a verb that is a little more uh, colorful, for lack of a better term. So take a sentence like this, Gra Grace went as fast as she could up the stairs. So rather than saying went as fast as, maybe I could just say Grace bolted up the stairs. And I do have to admit that I use a thesaurus quite a bit. Um, if And sometimes you can do that right on a Word document, there's a thesaurus function, but sometimes I just need a, a few ideas on some alternative. But a lot of times a really strong verb will just naturally tighten up your sentence and at the same time make it uh, a lot more colorful and engaging. Say something like we sat out by the pool and drank margaritas. Well, good for you. How about we lounged by the pool and slurped margaritas. I ran to the hardware store to pick up a new wrench so I could fix the broken pipe. How about I scurried to the hardware store and bought a wrench to fix the pipe? And then there is sparing the forms of to be. One of the most valuable pieces of feedback I ever received about my own writing was when I was in a writing group about, oh God, I think it's been about 30 years ago now. And we were, all writing fiction, short stories, and uh, sharing our work and then critiquing each other. And somebody said to me, your writing would be so much better if you found a way to not keep using various forms of to be in all of your 
storytelling. And I thought about that. I, I wasn't even aware that I was doing that. And there are ways that that really sneaks up on you. Here's one. Liz is always picking the fries off of Priscilla's plate. Or Lisa, I guess that is. Lisa always picks fries off Priscilla's plate. Just tightens it up a little bit without losing anything. Eric was seven feet tall and was the tallest member of the team. That's one where you could just find a, a verb like stood. I mean, Eric, the tallest member of the team, stood seven feet. I don't think you even need to say seven feet tall because you've already established he's the tallest member of the team. The pizza at Mario's is simply the best in town. Sometimes you can just say Mario serves the best pizza in town. Or it isn't wise for you to stay out past midnight. Why not tighten it to you shouldn't stay out past midnight? Or even just say you should come home before midnight. Or if you are in a position of authority, say with over a teenager or something like that, you can say come home before midnight. One thing I like to do, too, is avoid beginning a sentence with there, like there are, there is. Uh, example like this, there are five people in my office who are always late to meetings. Could be shortened to five people in my office arrive, arrive late to every meeting. And then there are specifics. Now, as much as I've been talking about tightening up sentences uh, and using shorter words, detail really enriches your message. So it's what you put into the sentence, no matter the length, uh, ideally a little bit shorter so it's digestible, but, but just the detail that you have in there that it, it paints more of a picture for the reader. And in many cases, it really boosts your credibility, depending on what you're writing about. So take an example like this, somebody just saying, we had a, a home cooked meal at Burt's. Okay, well, that's nice. How about Burt served us meatloaf, fresh green beans and mashed potatoes with gravy. Much more descriptive, gives the reader a much better idea of what you, what, whoever the writer is ate at Burt's. Or here's the credibility part of this. If I go in to say, or even I'm reading an advertisement and say at a car repair shop and they say, we can provide you with great service. I, over the years, have become very suspicious when people say that because great is a subjective term, subjective word, and what they think is great may not be to me. So I'd rather know exactly what they're going to do with my car when I take it in. So somebody who says our service includes an oil change, tire rotation, and safety check, I know what I'm getting. I'd rather hear this with this, with this detail than just saying I'm going to get great service. So, you know, I've read, and I don't know how much I agree with this, but I'm going to throw it out there to try to keep the length of your sentences to 15 to 20 words. I think if you get really overly conscious, just too bogged down on that, on concentrating on doing that, that your, your writing is going to step in and you're going to be spending way too much time just counting words. But it's something to keep in mind when you're editing your writing to see well can i pare this down a little bit this paragraph seems really long or this sentence seems really long so you might try to keep your paragraphs relatively short as well and i'm gonna here provide a few examples of uh sentences that could be pared down quite a bit and even getting into paragraphs and things like that. So here is, here's an example. 
These treatments are very often expensive and technically difficult, and their effectiveness very much depends on the overall health status of the patient in question. A couple of varies in there. So maybe just turn it around to the treatments can be expensive and difficult to provide. Their effectiveness depends on the patient's general health. So I rewrote what I found this and then I kind of rewrote it just to kind of pare it down a little bit and still get the point across. Here's one, although there is a clear walk signal for bikers and pedestrians, and they're not supposed to cross the intersection until the walk sign is on. If a motorist is coming around a curve and sees a person or a biker approaching the ramp, instinct may kick in, causing the motorist to swerve, stop, or react neg negatively to avoid the possibility of hitting him, which unfortunately may cause another collision altogether. That is one sentence. Why not? So let's let's uh, take this one to the barber. Maybe we could just say pedestrians and bicyclists are prohibited from crossing the intersection until the walk sign is on. But and some people disagree about using a conjunction to start a sentence. I do it all the time. I don't have a problem with it. But a driver coming around the curve might see someone approaching the ramp instinctively swerve or stop to avoid hitting the person and crash. So what we had before, we just tightened up, split into two sentences, and it's still uh, tighter than that one sentence. Yeah, I thought it was always wrong to begin a sentence with the word but. You know, I have, I do it all the time. I have not had it corrected ever. I think a lot of journalists do do it. I think when you're in English class, I always say not to do it, but your alternative is to use however. And I think however just is really stiff and, and it's lengthier. Sometimes but just works for me, so. And here's another one. This actually is an email that I was CC'd on a while back. After the discussion at our January 12th meeting, I decided to create a link to the shared document, which will help us to be able to directly access the team listing when one of us on the team needs to update our contact information. I think this is the most efficient way to keep our information up to date, yada, yada, yada. So what this person essentially was trying to communicate was this. That is really all she needed to say. So in everyday communication, like in emails, uh, texts, things like that, these are things to keep in mind, just practical writing almost. People do get a little resentful when they have to read 10 paragraphs to get to your point. They're feeling like you're wasting their time. And this is a way to just cut to the chase and it actually improves your credibility. This is another one I was CC'd on. The discomfort I have is that Doug is posting the list of members of the club to our webpage when I and others did not realize that he was doing so. Yes, it is true that the website is private, but we don't tell anyone in the club that the information will be posted. And I do believe we have an obligation, blah, blah, blah. That disclosure should be made by Doug himself, not by me. Okay, let's take a buzzsaw to this. Why not? I'm concerned that Doug posted our members' names to our website without telling us. He should inform everyone. That's really direct. Something else that is really useful is bullet points. And I use bullet points quite a bit, uh, especially when I'm doing magazine writing and I'm trying to explain something, and there are a lot of factors. Take a, a paragraph like this, where they're advising about flood conditions. This is aimed at uh, cleanup workers at flood sites. Flood conditions contribute to the growth and transmission of many kinds of fungi, some of which can cause illness. This goes on to talk about uh, moldy building materials, decaying vegetable matter, rotting waste of material, and other things. 
and that they can get into the respiratory tract or the fungal material can. So break it down like this. This is so much more digestible and just, just so much easier to read. Be careful when cleaning up after a flood, very direct. You may breathe in unhealthy mold in, and then it lists where the, the sources of that unhealthy mold. So bullets can really be your friend. Okay, so another thing to think about is knowing your art audience. Are you writing for experts, a niche audience, or a lay audience? And that will dictate to some extent what style you're going to use with your writing. And sometimes we forget that when we're writing. And there is a term that psychologists use and Steven Pinker, who I mentioned earlier, is the person who introduced me to this idea, the curse of knowledge. And that is when you know something so well, difficult as it may be to develop a knowledge for, that you just become completely oblivious to the fact that most people don't know what you're talking about. So you may know a topic, but you're, you've got to remember that your readers may not. So one technique to watch for this is to look in your copy for words, acronyms, abbreviations, anything that you had to learn at some point in the not so distant past. And think about is the average person, if I'm trying to communicate to a large number of people, is the average person gonna understand what that means? If you are writing to a small group, they all know the lingo, the jargon, things like that, that's one thing. But if you're really trying to communicate to be understood, uh, you might want to think twice about using some of those words and you need to watch for jargon. And here is, an example, and this is something that I wrote, and it's very jargony. A study revealed what happens in our brain when we use a GPS device or application to get to a destination. FMRI measures show relatively decreased, blah, blah, blah. Okay, they're talking about the anorinal, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that right, cortex and posterior hippocampus. Okay, so what I'm really writing about, and I took some time to rewrite it, is when we depend on GPS to reach a destination, activity decreases in the brain regions associated with navigation. So that is pretty understandable compared to what that previous paragraph was. And one way to help with this when you are communicating complex information is uh, using metaphors and analogies. They convey that really well. They also show your command of the subject and they make your prose more engaging. So to do that, sometimes these are just some exercises or, or techniques I've heard people talk about. Choose a character or an object or a setting to illustrate your point. Uh, read examples of metaphors and analogies just to generate some ideas for yourself. And some people try this. They just list, sit down and they list random nouns and then start free associating. What does a duck have? What? how would it be like what I'm trying to get across? So you see terms like this, these, these are just examples. I feel the stench of failure, he reeks of infidelity, warmth blanketed the area, time is a scoundrel, the sun caressed my, caressed my face. And I sort of made up this one on the fly, new love is like perfectly ripened fruit. And maybe I didn't need to use perfectly there. I don't know. But here are some other interesting examples. Uh, you should decide whether your startup will use either Macs or PCs, but not both. Macs and PCs don't play nicely together. 
So the person writing this could have gone into all kinds of detail about the technical issues involved in trying to build a, uh, a company network that can accommodate both Macs and PCs and how daunting that can be. Instead, he just sort of whittles it down to uh, the equivalent of children not getting along on the playground. And that gets the message across. I know that it's not going to be easy to build a network where Macs and PCs can interact. A job interview is a high stakes sport. You need a playbook. Or here's one, like a chef asks his staff to taste his dishes before serving, you need to ask friends to read your content to see if it lacks flavor. So I'll just show an example um, from a project I had to do at uh, a previous job where I was writing about uh, the impact that chronic stress has on our cells. So over the last decade, scientists have investigated how protracted psychological stress lowers telomerase activity, leading to shorter telomeres. As telomeres become shorter, cells age and die, a fate known as senescence. Studies have tied shorter telomeres to a wide range of aging-related diseases. But aren't they telomeres? I've heard them pronounced both ways. So I just kind of went with telomeres, but I've heard Sorry. telomeres too. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, so anyway, that, you know, a lot of people are got, not going to know what, what those are. And so that is the middle of the story. But the way I started this one out was to say, think of your body like an automobile. Both require regular maintenance, periodic repairs, and safe handling, and both inevitably wear down much earlier when they're subject to excessive strain and lax care. So that right away paints a picture of wear and tear. And you know that our cars rust, the batteries start to die, things like that. And what we're trying to get across is that this can happen to the body too, especially if it's going through a lot of chronic stress, like physical abuse, the death of a family member or unemployment, things like that. So one other thing about editing, let's talk about editing yourself. I mentioned, I think some of these earlier, but read your writing out loud to yourself to help spot missing words and run on sentences. I have to do this all the time. I am notorious for dropping words uh, and not noticing it. And when I read over my copy again, my brain is sort of filling in the blanks where a word might be missing. Sometimes it's just an article. Sometimes it's a much more critical word. Uh, you can always have a fit friend or family member read it. Uh, you can read each paragraph backwards uh, to help spot typos. I meant to say each sentence backwards. I uh, misspoke there or miswrote. That's a word. But uh, yeah, read each sentence backwards to, to help spot typos. Um, it's the technique a lot of people use. And lastly, uh, Grammarly. This program, a lot of people use, I use it a lot too. If you haven't used it, it's uh, a program where you can, you can find it on the web at grammarly.com. You just drop in your text and it will ask you what your objective is with the text. What, I mean, they'll give you uh, multiple choice questions, whether you're looking for uh, to communicate something in a formal way, uh, what audience you're aiming it for, what kind of audience, and um, a few other things I can't remember. And then it scores your text based on those objectives. And if you get, say, a 95 or a 96 uh, uh, score on what you've just written, then you're in pretty good shape. If you've got, say, a 67 or something like that, you might want to go back and work on your piece a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there.
uh, see what other thoughts have come up. I'm looking in the chat too. And I will include uh, some style manuals and things like that in the notes as reference for you. I've never heard of Grammarly. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah, it's really helpful. And, you know, this is a good point. What is the source or belief about sentence length? Um, I don't want to overemphasize brevity on the sentences. I think it's the way they're constructed and it's the syntax, really. It's, uh, you know, using verbs, I think they naturally just start to get a little shorter when you're paying attention to how you're, whether you're using active voice versus passive voice, uh, how often you're using forms of to be and things like that. They just kind of naturally start to tighten up, even if they end up being longer sentences, they're still uh, really readable and a little more uh enjoyable to read so yeah jean ann i see you have a hand up yes thanks scott and the comments are wonderful particularly how you both formatted and presented this class I wanted to ask about bullets i'm involved with doing a lot of analytical uh, and technical writing particularly in the area of strategic intelligence which can get okay kind of murky sometimes when are there too many bullets I had a lot of papers and writing where it looks just like a long checklist of bullets. It's maddening at times. So I'm trying to get a sense of, is there a balance when you need some paragraphs, you need some descriptors, you need to pull this together as opposed to having this endless list of bullets? Yeah, that so is any a- Any thoughts you have, I would appreciate. That is a great question. And yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I hadn't thought to include that in here, but yeah, you can go overboard with bullets. Uh, I know even like it with something like a resume today, they under each job you have, they advise you not to use more than three bullets per job or six, I'm sorry, six bullets per job to when you're describing all your accomplishments and things like that. I would, I don't know that there's a precise number that people advise you to use. Usually if you've got a list of say six, items that you want to put into a bullet, that's usually pretty good. Um, when you're doing that, sometimes you can look at ways if you're at first just drafting something and you've got like 10 bullets, 12 bullets, you can look at ways that maybe you could combine some of what you're trying to get across into a single bullet. Uh, if there are similarities between a couple of things on there, you might be able to combine those. I do that sometimes where I think I've got too many bullets and I can just sort of combine a couple together just to whittle it down a bit. Scott, so. this is Mary Virginia. Yeah, Mary. I've got, I've got a question. And my question is that back when we were all in fourth grade, we were all taught to outline things as sort of our pre-writing. And I've been an educator for 38 years. And so it's moved from outlining to graphic organizers. Are there any of the pre-writing things that you think are more useful for adult writers um, than what we are uh, advising younger children and uh, teenagers to use as pre-writing? Wow, that, you know, that's a hard question for me to answer personally because I am not the best at outlining. Um, and part of that, yeah, so I, I guess, Mary, I don't know, if I have an answer to that question, just because I don't use those, my approach, and I don't want to present this as the right approach, but I tend to really focus, especially when I'm writing a magazine piece, I, I may spend hours just working on my first couple of paragraphs, my lead. And I can't, for some reason, I am just psychologically incapable of going any further uh, uh, until I have that, <laughs> that those first two paragraphs done. And then it just kind of flows for me. But that's a long road to get to that flow. And so 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know too much about any of those of, of those tools that might be out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or thoughts? Got a couple of minutes left. No? Okay. Well, I uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, some of the points you may disagree with, and that is okay. Writing is a subjective craft. So, uh, you know, some of it is artistry, and you have to think about what is important for you to communicate. And, and some of these tips, I hope, can help you communicate them as effectively as possible. So... Yeah, you know, it's funny, Scott, I was just thinking that like sometimes you could read things where the author takes all these rules and throws them out the window and it's their writing is so unusual and, and they break all the rules but but I think still for the average person these rules are very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah and I guess it helps to know the, the rules. joys of travel so you, are if you're going to break them you need to know what they are in the first place <laughs> <laughs> Great yeah. Cities. Right. Yeah. across the sea well, thank you oh well thank you i am gonna just show you these takeaways I, these are just a list of takeaways that i will send you uh know your audience think about those adverbs and worn out phrases you can you can drop avoid redundancy get creative with your verbs the joys of travel and are so on and so your on. journey so takes i'll include you. all of this peaceful in parts. what i send you later very helpful great Thank cities you. yes and uh, just to give you a heads up we'd love to know what you thought about town. the class or if Even you end up applying any of what we you can venture we out went over today spirit. uh travel you can is a let us you can share that on facebook travelers follow Back, their uh, dreams. You and can uh, even email Liz at getsetup.io. I've got a few typos in here. I was putting this together uh, all week, but I obviously did not edit it as much as I should. So I've got egg on my face, but uh, it's Liz at getsetup.io. If you ever want to share a piece of your writing with her, uh, she's always looking for success stories from our learner community. Uh, related classes coming up in the creativity realm. Uh, nature plus journaling equals happy. Creating a morning routine for a better day, which can include any kind of creative endeavor you're using. And then there is a creative writing class that uh, another Get Set Up Guide teaches if you're interested in learning more about just the creative process. And I was going to have two classes listed here, but I, I obviously didn't finish this slide. I'm teaching a class tomorrow on creating cards and invitations on a platform called Canva. If you're not familiar with that, it is a online uh, do-it-yourself graphic design platform that is pretty fun to play around with. So I'd love it if you could make that. The other one that I didn't finish here is just a an iPhone basics class that I teach every Monday, and it just goes over the basics of the uh, iPhone settings. So if you're new to the iPhone, you might want to sit in on that. So you'll be getting these key takeaways, and we'll also have uh, some other suggested classes for you, some feedback or some a schedule, link to the schedule that you can look at, and then a little uh, link to a feedback form. Feedback form defaults for in terms of rating the class and the guide, it defaults to four stars, which you can decrease or increase depending on your feelings about the class. Any comments you have about it, any uh, suggestions you have for what might make the class better or what isn't working with it. We would love to hear this is a brand new class. So that information would really be invaluable to us right now. And lastly, if there is any other class that you would love to see us offer, anything you'd like to learn and you don't see it on our class list, please drop it into the uh, field right here on the form because we are always looking for new class ideas and some of the best classes we've developed have 
emanated from suggestion, suggestions we've received from you, our learners. And lastly, whoops, keep going backwards here. Lastly, uh, I want to just get, uh, do a plug for Get Set Up. You can spread the word about it. We'd really appreciate it. You can even on the new website for Get Set Up, there is a spot for, if you sign up for a class, you can share that. We just recently redid this. So go to a class and you can tell friends about it. Just click here and you can share it on Facebook, on WhatsApp, or just email it or copy this link and drop it into an email. So lots of ways to get the word out. Uh, if you're interested in hosting an interest group uh, for discussion on a hobby that you want to talk about with other people who share that hobby, you want to talk about writing, uh, you could host a group to just share writing, talk about the process, just let us know. You can just email us at help at getsetup.io and uh, express your interest in doing that, and we can help you from there. And that is also the email address you use to request a recording of this session if you're interested in that. Okay. So I uh, hope this was useful to you. I really enjoyed spending the last hour with you. I'm glad we had some time to, to have some discussion as well. So. So I hope you all have a great weekend and uh, hope to see you again really soon. Okay, take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.